Black Clock Audio Tales 2019, Mary Shelley. Brought to you by BunnySlippers.com. Check out the brand new Dino Sound Slippers. Slippers make a roaring sound every three steps. Made with green, scaly-looking fabric that's actually a soft plush. Foam footbeds, non-slip grips on your soles so you don't slip around. One size fits most up to women's 10.5, men's 9. Footbed measures 10.5. Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story, either a chapter or two at a time, or a couple of short stories, maybe some folklore. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us at the end of the month every last Tuesday of the month where we have The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, where you get to hear me talk in a lot more dumb voices than right now. Look for us wherever you look for podcasts, rate, review, and give us five, four, three, two, one stars. We don't like the one and two stars, but hey, if that's how you feel, you probably have a vendetta against us and don't know how to use the skip button. We are on the Instagram, the Facebook, and the Twitter as Black Clock Audio Tales, or just Google us, Black Clock Audio Tales. There's no one else named that, otherwise we wouldn't name it this. Thank you, and let's get going with The Last Man by Mary Shelley. Recording by Stephanie Dupal de Martin. The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, Volume 3, Chapter 9. Now, soft a while, have I arrived so near the end? Yes. It is all over now. A step or two over those new-made graves, and the wearisome way is done. Can I accomplish my task? Can I streak my paper with words capacious of the grand conclusion? Quit thy Cimmerian solitude. Bring with thee murky fogs from hell, which may drink up the day. Bring blight and pestiferous exhalations, which, entering the hollow caverns and breathing places of earth, may fill her stony veins with corruption, so that not only herbage may no longer flourish, the trees may rot, and the rivers run with gall. But the everlasting mountains be decomposed, and the mighty deep putrefy, and the genial atmosphere which clips and globe lose all powers of generation and sustenance. Do this sad visage power while I write, while eyes read these pages. And who will read them? Beware, tender offspring of the reborn world, beware, fair being, with human heart, yet untamed by care and human brow, yet unplowed by time. Beware, lest the cheerful current of thy blood be checked, thy golden locks turn gray, thy sweet dimpling smiles be changed to fixed harsh wrinkles. Let not day look on these lines, lest garish day waste, turn pale, and die. Seek a cypress grove, whose moaning boughs will be harmony befitting. Seek some cave, deep embowered in earth's darkened trails, where no light will penetrate save that which struggles, red and flickering, through a single fissure staining thy page with grimmest livery of death. There is a painful confusion in my brain which refuses to delineate distinctly succeeding events. Sometimes the irradiation of my friend's gentle smile comes before me, and methinks its light spans and fills eternity. Then, again, I feel the gasping throes. We quitted Como, and in compliance with Adrian's earnest desire, we took Venice in our way to Rome. There was something to the English peculiarly attractive in the idea of this wave-encircled island-enthroned city. We went down the Po and the Brenta in a boat, and the days proving intolerably hot, we rested in the bordering palaces during the day, traveling through the night when darkness made the bordering banks indistinct, and our solitude less remarkable, when the wandering moon lit the waves that divided before our prow, and the night wind filled our sails, and the murmuring stream, waving trees, and swelling canvas accorded in harmonious strain. Clara, long overcome by excessive grief, had to a great degree cast aside her timid, cold reserve, and received our attentions with grateful tenderness, while Adrian with poetic fervor discoursed of the glorious nations of the dead, of the beauteous earth and the fate of man, she crept near him, drinking in his speech with silent pleasure. We banished from our talk, and as much as possible from our thoughts, the knowledge of our desolation. 
and it would be incredible to an inhabitant of cities to one among a busy throng to what extent we succeeded it was as a man can find in a dungeon whose small and grated rift at first renders the doubtful light more sensibly obscure till the visual orb having drunk in the beam and adapted itself to its scantiness he finds that clear noon inhabits his cell so we a simple triad on empty earth were multiplied to each other till we became all in all we stood like trees whose roots are loosened by the wind which support one another leaning and clinging with increased fervour while the wintry storms howl thus we floated down the widening stream of the po sleeping when the cicale sang awake with the stars we entered the narrow banks of the brenta and arrived at the shore of the laguna at sunrise on the sixth of september the bright orb slowly rose from behind its cupolas and towers and shed its penetrating light upon the glassy waters wrecks of gondolas and some few uninjured ones were strewn on the beach at fusina we embarked in one of these for the widowed daughter of ocean who abandoned and fallen sat forlorn on her propping isles looking towards the far mountains of greece we rowed lightly over the laguna and entered canale grande the tide ebbed suddenly from out the broken portals and violated halls of venice seaweed and sea monsters were left on the blackened marble while the salt ooze defaced the matchless works of art that adorned the walls and the seagull flew out from the shattered window in the midst of this appalling ruin of the monuments of man's power nature asserted her ascendancy and shone more beauteous from the contrast the radiant waters hardly trembled while the rippling waves made many-sided mirrors to the sun the blue immensity seen beyond lido stretched far unspecked by boat so tranquil so lovely that it seemed to invite us to quit the land strewn with ruins and to seek refuge from sorrow and fear on its placid extent we saw the ruins of this hapless city from the height of the tower of san marco immediately under us and turned with sickening hearts to the sea which though it be a grave rears no monument discloses no ruin evening had come apace the sun set in calm majesty behind the misty summits of the apennines and its golden and roseate hues painted the mountains of the opposite shore that land said adrian tinged with the last glories of the day is greece Greece, the sound had a responsive chord in the bosom of Clara. She vehemently reminded us that we had promised to take her once again to Greece, to the tomb of her parents. Why go to Rome? What should we do at Rome? We might take one of the many vessels to be found here, embark in it, and steer right for Albania. I objected the dangers of ocean, and the distance of the mountains we saw from Athens, a distance which from the savage uncultivation of the country was almost impassable. Adrian, who was delighted with Clara's proposal, obviated these objections. The season was favorable, the northwest that blew, would take us transversely across the gulf, and then we might find, in some abandoned port, a light Greek caique, adapted for such navigation, and run down the coast of the Moria, and passing over the isthmus of Corinth, without much land travelling or fatigue, find ourselves at Athens. This appeared to me wild talk, but the sea, glowing with a thousand purple hues, looked so brilliant and safe, my beloved companions were so earnest, so determined, that, when Adrian said, Well, though it is not exactly what you wish, yet consent to please me, I could no longer refuse. That evening we selected a vessel whose size just seemed fitted for our enterprise. We bent the sails and put the rigging in order, and reposing that night in one of the city's thousand palaces, agreed to embark at sunrise the following morning when winds that move not its calm surface sweep the azure sea i love the land no more the smiles of the serene and tranquil deep tempt my unquiet mind thus said adrian quoting a translation of moschus's poem as in the clear morning light we rode over the laguna past lido into the open sea i would have added in continuation but when the roar of ocean's gray abyss resounds, and foam gathers upon the sea, and vast waves burst. But my friends declared that such verses were evil augury, so in cheerful mood we left the shallow waters, and, when out at sea, unfurled our sails to catch the favorable breeze. The laughing morning air filled them, while sunlight bathed earth, sky, and ocean. The placid waves divided to receive our keel, and playfully kissed the dark sides of our little skiff, murmuring a welcome as land receded still the blue expanse most waveless twin sister to the azure empyrean afforded smooth conduct to our bark 
as the air and waters were tranquil and balmy, so were our minds steeped in quiet. In comparison with the unstained deep, funeral earth appeared a grave, its high rocks and stately mountains were but monuments, its trees the plumes of a hearse, the brooks and rivers breakish with tears for departed man. Farewell to desolate towns, to fields with their savage intermixture of corn and weeds, to ever multiplying relics of our lost species. Ocean, we commit ourselves to thee. Even as a patriarch of old floated above the drowned world, let us be saved, as thus we betake ourselves to thy perennial flood. Adrian sat at the helm, I attended to the rigging, the breeze right aft filled our swelling canvas, and we ran before it over the untroubled deep. The wind died away at noon, its idle breath just permitted us to hold our course. As lazy, fair-weather sailors, careless of the coming hour, we talked gaily of our coasting voyage, of our arrival at Athens. We would make our home of one of the Cyclades, and there in myrtle groves, amidst perpetual spring, fanned by the wholesome sea breezes, we would live long years in beatific union. Was there such a thing as death in the world? The sun passed its zenith, and lingered down the stainless floor of heaven. Lying in the boat, my face turned up to the sky. I thought I saw in its blue-white marbled streaks, so slight, so immaterial, that now I said, They are there, and now it is a mere imagination. A sudden fear stung me while I gazed, and starting up and running to the prow, as I stood my hair was gently lifted on my brow. A dark line of ripples appeared to the east, gaining rapidly on us. My breathless remark to Adrian was followed by the flapping of the canvas as the adverse wind struck it and our boat lurched. Swift as speech, the web of the storm thickened overhead, the sun went down red, the dark sea was strewed with foam, and our skiff rose and fell in its increasing furrows. Behold us now in our frail tenement, hemmed in by hungry, roaring waves, buffeted by winds. In the inky east two vast clouds sailing contrary ways met. The lightning leapt forth, and the hoarse thunder muttered. Again in the south the clouds replied, and the forked stream of fire running along the black sky showed us the appalling piles of clouds, now met and obliterated by the heaving waves. Great God, and we alone, we three alone, sole dwellers on the sea and on the earth, we three must perish. The vast universe, its myriad worlds, and the plains of boundless earth which we had left, the extent of shoreless sea around, contracted to my view. They and all that they contained shrunk up to one point, even to her tossing bark freighted with glorious humanity. A convulsion of despair crossed the love-beaming face of Adrian, while with set teeth he murmured, Yet they shall be saved. Clara, visited by a human pang, pale and trembling, crept near him. He looked on her with an encouraging smile. Do you fear, sweet girl? Oh, do not fear. We shall soon be on shore. The darkness prevented me from seeing the changes of her countenance, but her voice was clear and sweet as she replied, Why should I fear? Neither sea nor storm can harm us, if mighty destiny or the ruler of destiny does not permit. And then the stinging fear of surviving either of you is not here. One death will clasp us undivided. Meanwhile we took in all our sails save a gib, and as soon as we might without danger changed our course, running with the wind for the Italian shore. Dark night mixed everything. We hardly discerned the white crests of the murderous surges, except when lightning made brief noon and drank the darkness, showing us our danger and restoring us to double night. We were all silent, except when Adrian, as steersman, made an encouraging observation. Our little shell obeyed the rudder miraculously well and ran along on the top of the waves as if she had been an offspring of the sea, and the angry mother sheltered her endangered child. I sat at the prow watching our course, when suddenly I heard the waters break with redoubled fury. We were certainly near the shore. At the same time I cried, About there! And a broad lightning filling the concave showed us for one moment the level beach ahead, disclosing even the sands and stunted ooze-sprinkled beds of reeds that grew at high water mark. Again it was dark, and we drew in our breath with such content as one may who, while fragments of volcano-hurled rock darken the air, sees a vast mass ploughing the ground immediately at his feet. What to do we knew not. The breakers, here, there, everywhere encompassed us. They roared and dashed and flung their hated spray in our faces. 
With considerable difficulty and danger we succeeded at length in altering our course, and stretched out from shore. I urged my companions to prepare for the wreck of our little skiff, and to bind themselves to some oar or spar which might suffice to float them. I was myself an excellent swimmer. The very sight of the sea was wont to raise in me such sensations as a huntsman experiences when he hears a pack of hounds in full cry. I loved to feel the waves wrap me and strive to overpower me, while I, lord of myself, moved this way or that in spite of their angry buffetings. Adrian also could swim, but the weakness of his frame prevented him from feeling pleasure in the exercise or acquiring any great expertness. But what power could the strongest swimmer oppose to the overpowering violence of ocean in its fury? My efforts to prepare my companions were rendered nearly futile, for the roaring breakers prevented our hearing one another speak, and the waves that broke continually over our boat obliged me to exert all my strength in lading the water out as fast as it came in. The wild darkness, palpable and rayless, hemmed us round, dissipated only by the lightning. Sometimes we beheld thunderbolts, fiery red, fall into the sea, and at intervals vast spouts stooped from the clouds, churning the wild ocean which rose to meet them, while the fierce gale bore the rack onwards, and they were lost in the chaotic mingling of sky and sea. Our gunwales had been torn away, our single sail had been rent to ribbons, and borne down the stream of the wind. We had cut away our mast, and lightened the boat of all she contained. Clara attempted to assist me in heaving the water from the hold, and as she turned her eyes to look on the lightning, I could discern by that momentary gleam that resignation had conquered every fear. We have a power given us in any worst extremity, which props the else feeble mind of man, and enables us to endure the most savage tortures with the stillness of soul, which in hours of happiness we could not have imagined. A calm more dreadful in truth than the tempest, allayed the wild beatings of my heart, a calm like that of the gamester, the suicide and the murderer, when the last die is on the point of being cast, while the poisoned cup is at the lips, as the death blow is about to be given. Hours passed thus, hours which might write old age on the face of beardless youth and grizzle the silky hair of infancy, hours while the chaotic uproar continued, while each dread gust transcended in fury the one before and our skiff hung on the breaking wave, and then rushed into the valley below, and trembled and spun between the watery precipices that seemed most to meet above her. For a moment the gale paused, and ocean sank to comparative silence. It was a breathless interval, the wind which, as a practiced leaper, had gathered itself up before it sprung, now with terrific roar, rushed over the sea, and the waves struck our stern. Adrian exclaimed that the rudder was gone, we are lost, cried Clara. Save yourselves, oh, save yourselves! The lightning showed me the poor girl half buried in the water at the bottom of the boat. As she was sinking in it, Adrian caught her up and sustained her in his arms. We were without a rudder. We rushed bow foremost into the vast billows piled up ahead. They broke over and filled the tiny skiff. One scream I heard, one cry that we were gone I uttered. I found myself in the waters. Darkness was around. When the light of the tempest flashed, I saw the keel of her upset boat close to me. I clung to this, grasping it with clenched hand and nails, while I endeavored during each flash to discover any appearance of my companions. I thought I saw Adrian at no great distance from me, clinging to an oar. I sprung from my hold, and with energy beyond my human strength, I dashed aside the waters as I strove to lay hold of him. As that hope failed, instinctive love of life animated me, and feelings of contention as if a hostile will combated with mine. I breasted the surges and flung them from me, as I would the opposing front and sharpened claws of a lion about to enfang my bosom. When I had been beaten down by one wave, I rose on another while I felt bitter pride curl my lip. Ever since the storm had carried us near the shore, we had never attained any great distance from it. With every flash I saw the bordering coast, yet the progress I made was small, while each wave as it receded carried me back into ocean's far abysses. At one moment I felt my foot touch the sand, and then again I was in deep water. My arms began to lose their power of motion. My breath failed me under the influence of the strangling waters. A thousand wild and delirious thoughts crossed me. 
as well as I can now recall them, my chief feeling was how sweet it would be to lay my head on the quiet earth where the surges would no longer strike my weakened frame, nor the sound of waters ring in my ears to attain this repose. Not to save my life, I made a last effort. The shelving shore suddenly presented a footing for me. I rose and was again thrown down by the breakers. A point of rock to which I was unable to cling gave me a moment's respite, and then, taking advantage of the ebbing of the waves, I ran forwards, gained the dry sands, and fell senseless on the oozy reeds that sprinkled them. I must have lain long deprived of life, for when first, with a sickening feeling, I enclosed my eyes, the light of morning met them. Great change had taken place meanwhile. Grey dawn dappled the flying clouds, which sped onwards, leaving visible at intervals vast lakes of pure ether. A fountain of light arose in an increasing stream from the east, behind the waves of the Adriatic, changing the grey to a rosied hue, and then flooding sky and sea with aerial gold. A kind of stupor followed my fainting. My senses were alive, but memory was extinct. The blessed respite was short, a snake lurked near me to sting me into life. On the first retrospect emotion I would have started up, but my limbs refused to obey me, my knees trembled, the muscles had lost all power. I still believed that I might find one of my beloved companions cast like me half alive on the beach, and I strove in every way to restore my frame to the use of its animal functions. I wrung the brine from my hair, and the rays of the risen sun soon visited me with genial warmth. With the restoration of my bodily powers, my mind became in some degree aware of the universe of misery, henceforth to be its dwelling. I ran to the water's edge, calling on the beloved names. Ocean drank in, and absorbed my feeble voice, replying with pitiless roar. I climbed a near tree. The level sands bounded by a pine forest, and the sea clipped round by the horizon was all that I could discern. In vain I extended my researches along the beach. The mast we had thrown overboard, with tangled cordage and remnants of a sail, was a sole relic land received of our wreck. Sometimes I stood still and wrung my hands. I accused earth and sky, the universal machine, and the almighty power that misdirected it. Again I threw myself on the sands, and then the sighing wind, mimicking a human cry, roused me to bitter, fallacious hope. Assuredly, if any little bark or smallest canoe had been near, I should have sought the savage plains of ocean, found the dear remains of my lost ones, and, clinging round them, have shared their grave. The day passed thus, each moment contained eternity, although one hour after hour had gone by, I wondered at the quick flight of time. Yet even now I had not drunk the bitter potion to the dregs. I was not yet persuaded of my loss. I did not yet feel in every pulsation, in every nerve, in every thought that I remained alone of my race, that I was the last man. The day had clouded over, and a drizzling rain set in at sunset. Even the eternal skies weep, I thought. Is there any shame, then, that mortal man should spend himself in tears? I remembered the ancient fables in which human beings are described as dissolving away through weeping into ever-gushing fountains. Ah, that so it were. And then my destiny would be in some sort akin to the watery death of Adrian and Clara. Oh, grief is fantastic. It weaves a web on which to trace the history of its woe from every form and change around. It incorporates itself with all living nature. It finds sustenance in every object. As light, it fills all things, and, like light, it gives its own colors to all. I had wandered in my search to some distance from the spot on which I had been cast, and came to one of those watch-towers which at stated distances lined the Italian shore. I was glad of shelter, glad to find a work of human hands, after I had gazed so long on nature's drear barrenness. So I entered and ascended the rough winding staircase into the guard-room. So far was fate kind that no harrowing vestige remained of its former inhabitants. A few planks laid across two iron trestles, and strewed with the dried leaves of Indian corn was the bed presented to me, and an open chest containing some half-moldered biscuit awakened an appetite which perhaps existed before, but of which, until now, I was not aware. Thirst also, violent and parching, the result of the sea-water I had drank, and of the exhaustion of my frame, tormented me. 
Kind nature had gifted the supply of these wants with pleasurable sensations, so that I, even I, was refreshed and calmed, as I ate of this sorry fare and drank a little of the sour wine which half filled the flask left in this abandoned dwelling. Then I stretched myself on the bed, not to be disdained by the victim of shipwreck. The earthy smell of the dried leaves was balm to my sense after the hateful odor of seaweed. I forgot my state of loneliness. I neither looked backward nor forward. My senses were hushed to repose. I fell asleep and dreamed of all dear inland scenes, of haymakers, of the shepherd's whistle to his dog, when he demanded his help to drive the flock to fold of sights and sounds peculiar to my boyhood's mountain life, which I had long forgotten. I awoke in a painful agony, for I fancied the ocean breaking its bounds carried away the fixed continent and deep-rooted mountains, together with the streams I loved, the woods and the flocks, it raged around with that continued and dreadful roar which had accompanied the last wreck of surviving humanity. As my waking sense returned, the bare walls of the guardroom closed round me, and the rain pattered against the single window. How dreadful it is to emerge from the oblivion of slumber, and to receive as a good morrow with the mute wailing of one's own hapless heart, to return from the land of deceptive dreams to the heavy knowledge of unchanged disaster. Thus was it with me, now and for ever. The sting of other griefs might be blunted by time and even mine yielded sometimes during the day, to the pleasure inspired by the imagination or the senses, but I never look first upon the morning light, but with my fingers pressed tight on my bursting heart, and my soul deluged with the interminable flood of hopeless misery. Now I awoke for the first time in the dead world, I awoke alone, and the dull dirge of the sea, heard even amidst the rain, recalled me to the reflection of the wretch I had become. The sound came like a reproach, a scoff, like the sting of remorse in the soul. I gasped. The veins and muscles of my throat swelled, suffocating me. I put my fingers to my ears. I buried my head in the leaves of my couch. I would have dived to the center to lose hearing of that hideous moan. What a pitiable, forlorn, disconsolate being I was. My very aspect and garb told the tale of my despair. My hair was matted and wild, my limbs soiled with salt ooze. While at sea I had thrown off those of my garments that encumbered me, and the rain drenched the thin summer clothing I had retained. My feet were bare and the stunted reeds and broken shells made them bleed. The while I hurried to and fro now looking earnestly on some distant rock which, islanded in the sands, bore for a moment a deceptive appearance now with flashing eyes reproaching the murderous ocean for its unutterable cruelty. For a moment I compared myself to that monarch of the waste, Robinson Crusoe. We had been both thrown companionless, he on the shore of a desolate island, I on that of a desolate world. I was rich in the so-called goods of life. If I turned my steps from the near barren scene, and entered any of the earth's million cities, I should find their wealth stored up for my accommodation, clothes, food, books, and a choice of dwelling beyond the command of the princes of former times. Every climate was subject to my selection, while he was obliged to toil in the acquirement of every necessary, and was the inhabitant of a tropical island, against whose heats and storms he could obtain small shelter. Viewing the question thus, who would not have preferred the sybarite enjoyments I would command, the philosophic leisure and ample intellectual resources, to his life of labor and peril? Yet he was far happier than I, for he could hope, nor hope in vain, the destined vessel at last arrived, to bear him to countrymen and kindred, where the events of his solitude became a fireside tale. To none could I ever relate the story of my adversity, no hope had I. He knew that, beyond the ocean which begirt his lonely island, thousands lived whom the sun enlightened when it shone also on him. Beneath the meridian sun and visiting moon, I alone bore human features. I alone could give articulation to thought, and when I slept, both day and night were unbeheld of any. He had fled from his fellows, and was transported with terror at the print of a human foot. I would have knelt down and worshipped the same the wild and cruel Caribbee, the merciless cannibal, or worse than these, the uncouth, brute, and remorseless veteran of the vices of civilization, would have been to me a beloved companion, a treasure dearly prized. 
His nature would be kin to mine, his form cast in the same mould. Human blood would flow in his veins. A human sympathy must link us for ever. It cannot be that I shall never behold a fellow being more. Never, never, not in the course of years, shall I wake and speak to none past the interminable hours my soul islanded in the world, a solitary point surrounded by vacuum. Will day follow day endlessly thus? No, no, a god rules the world. Providence has not exchanged its golden scepter for an aspic sting. Away, let me fly from the ocean grave, let me depart from this barren nook, paled in as it is from access by its own desolateness. Let me tread once again the paved towns, step over the threshold of man's dwellings, and most certainly I shall find this thought a horrible vision, a maddening but evanescent dream. I entered Ravenna, the town nearest to the spot whereon I had been cast, before the second sun had set on the empty world. I saw many living creatures, oxen and horses and dogs, but there was no man among them. I entered a cottage, it was vacant. I ascended the marble stairs of a palace, the bats and the owls were nestled in the tapestry. I stepped softly, not to awaken the sleeping town. I rebuked a dog that by yelping disturbed the sacred stillness. I would not believe that all was as it seemed. The world was not dead, but I was mad. I was deprived of sight, hearing, and sense of touch. I was laboring under the force of a spell which permitted me to behold all sights of earth except its human inhabitants. They were pursuing their ordinary labors. Every house had its inmate, but I could not perceive them. If I could have deluded myself into a belief of this kind, I should have been far more satisfied but my brain, tenacious of its reason, refused to lend itself to such imaginations, and though I endeavored to play the antic to myself, I knew that I, the offspring of man, during long years one among many, now remain sole survivor of my species. The sun sank behind the western hills. I had fasted since the preceding evening, but, though faint and weary, I loathed food, nor ceased while yet a ray of light remained to pace the lonely streets. Night came on, and sent every living creature but me to the bosom of its mate. It was my solace to blunt my mental agony by personal hardship. Of the thousand beds around, I would not seek the luxury of one. I lay down on the pavement. A cold marble step served me for a pillow. Midnight came, and then, though not before, did my wearied lids shut out the sight of the twinkling stars, and the reflex on the pavement near. Thus I passed the second night of my desolation. End of chapter 9. Hey listeners, sorry for the interruption. More The Last Man coming up. But before that, I'd like to thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you and your suggestions for future episodes and topic ideas at facebook.com Black Clock Audio. Help support the show by keeping it paywall free by going to paypal.me slash pgttcm and donate a buck or five to pgttcm.podbean.com and become a patron. We'll never ask you for your info or ask you to fill out a survey or just tell your friends about us. That's, that's all we ask. Do you have no cash to donate? That's fine. Neither do we. Help the show by sharing, rating, liking, or five-star giving wherever you get your podcasts from. You can always buy a cool shirt from pgttcm.threadless.com and if you're wondering hey what's all this pgttcm stuff about people's guide to the cthulhu mythos is our monthly end of the month show where we talk to cthulhu mythos writers game designers talk about various aspects of the cthulhu mythos going from the big bang to the cooling of our sun just the whole whole, whole kit and caboodle from the perspective of earthlings of course Next month is going to be Ambrose Bitter Bierce, one of my favorite weird fiction authors who also wrote Civil War tales and spooky dooky stories and also, you know, occur Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, that, that uh, story your 8th or ninth grade English teacher made you read. Yeah, Ambrose Bierce, but we won't hold that against him. It's a good story, though. And in August, we're going to have... Anyone but Durleth, Cthulhu Mythos, non Durlethian Mythos stories, and more about August Durleth himself and Arkham House Publishing, and pretty much, I don't know, kind of talk about why everyone makes fun of August Durleth, but 
without him, uh, there's, there's, there's some stuff that would be missing. September. Bronte, Bronte, Bronte. Oh yeah, it's gonna be all about the Brontes. And of course, we'll more than likely have Andrew Grace uh, talking about the Brontes again, because Andrew Grace likes to talk about the Brontes. October, nothing but spooky stories that you can play all October long, and ooh, maybe even December and November when it's even darker and scarier. And November will be Old English Lit. So we're going to be doing stuff like Beowulf and stuff around that neck of the woods. Old English 800 Lit. It's that smooth, mellow lit that gives you more power. Old English 800 Lit. And we don't have anything planned for December. But hey, if you want to pitch in your two cents or your, I don't know, uh, opinion, we can, we, we'll listen, we'll check it out. And if it's something that we can arrange, then it's something we can do. So... Your input is always appreciated. Thank you so much, and back to Mary Shelley's The Last Man. Recording by Christine Blashford, www.sidepodcast.com. The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Volume 3, Chapter 10. I awoke in the morning, just as the higher windows of the lofty houses received the first beams of the rising sun. The birds were chirping, perched on the window sills and deserted thresholds of the doors. I awoke and my first thought was, Adrian and Clara are dead. I no longer shall be hailed by their good morrow, or pass the long day in their society. I shall never see them more. The ocean has robbed me of them, stolen their hearts of love from their breasts, and given over to corruption what was dearer to me than light or life or hope. I was an untaught shepherd boy when Adrian deigned to confer on me his friendship. The best years of my life had been passed with him. All I had possessed of this world's goods, of happiness, knowledge, or virtue, I owed to him. He had, in his person, his intellect and rare qualities, given a glory to my life which without him it had never known. Beyond all other beings he had taught me that goodness, pure and single, can be an attribute of man. It was a sight for angels to congregate to behold, to view him lead, govern, and solace the last days of the human race. My lovely Clara also was lost to me, she who last of the daughters of man exhibited all those feminine and maiden virtues which poets, painters and sculptors have in their various languages strove to express. Yet as far as she was concerned, could I lament that she was removed in early youth from the certain advent of misery? Pure she was of soul, and all her intents were holy, but her heart was the throne of love, and the sensibility her lovely countenance expressed was the profit of many woes, not the less deep and drear because she would have for ever concealed them. These two wondrously endowed beings had been spared from the universal wreck to be my companions during the last year of solitude. I had felt while they were with me all their worth. I was conscious that every other sentiment, regret or passion had by degrees merged into a yearning, clinging affection for them. I had not forgotten the sweet partner of my youth, mother of my children, my adored Idris, but I saw at least a part of her spirit alive again in her brother, and after, that by Evelyn's death I had lost what most dearly recalled her to me, I enshrined her memory in Adrian's form, and endeavoured to confound the two dear ideas. I sound the depths of my heart, and try in vain to draw thence the expressions that can typify my love for those remnants of my race. If regret and sorrow came athwart me, as well it might in our solitary and uncertain state, the clear tones of Adrian's voice and his fervent look dissipated the gloom. Or I was cheered unaware by the mild content and sweet resignation Clara's cloudless brow and deep blue eyes expressed. They were all to me, the sons of my benighted soul, repose in my weariness, slumber in my sleepless woe. Ill, most ill, with disjointed words, bare and weak, have I expressed the feeling with which I clung to them. I would have wound myself like ivy inextricably round them, so that the same blow might destroy us. I would have entered and been a part of them, so that, if the dull substance of my flesh were thought, even now I had accompanied them to their new and incommunicable abode. Never shall I see them more. I am bereft of their dear converse, bereft of sight of them. I am a tree rent by lightning, never will the bark close over the bared fibres, never will their quivering life, torn by the winds, receive the opiate of a moment's balm. I am alone in the world. But that expression as yet was less pregnant with misery than that Adrian and Clara are dead. The tide of thought and feeling rolls on for ever the same, though the banks and shapes around which govern its course and the reflection in the wave vary. Thus the sentiment of immediate loss in some sort decayed while that of utter irremediable loneliness grew on me with time. Three days I wandered through Ravenna, now thinking only of the beloved beings who slept in the oozy caves of ocean, now looking forward on the dread blank before me, shuddering to make an onward step, writhing at each change that marked the progress of the hours. For three days I wandered to and fro in this melancholy town. 
I passed whole hours in going from house to house, listening whether I could detect some lurking sign of human existence. Sometimes I rang at a bell, it tinkled through the vaulted rooms, and silence succeeded to the sound. I called myself hopeless, yet still I hoped, and still disappointment ushered in the hours, intruding the cold, sharp steel which first pierced me, into the aching, festering wound. I fed like a wild beast, which seizes its food only when stung by intolerable hunger. I did not change my garb or seek the shelter of a roof during all those days. Burning heats, nervous irritation, a ceaseless but confused flow of thought, sleepless nights and days instinct with a frenzy of agitation, possessed me during that time. As the fever of my blood increased, a desire of wandering came upon me. I remember that the sun had set on the fifth day after my wreck, when, without purpose or aim, I quitted the town of Ravenna. I must have been very ill. Had I been possessed by more or less of delirium, that night had surely been my last, for, as I continued to walk on the banks of the Mantome, whose upward course I followed, I looked wistfully on the stream, acknowledging to myself that its pellucid waves could medicine my woes for ever, and was unable to account to myself for my tardiness in seeking their shelter from the poisoned arrows of thought that were piercing me through and through. I walked a considerable part of the night, and excessive weariness at length conquered my repugnance to the availing myself of the deserted habitations of my species. The waning moon which had just riven showed me a cottage whose neat entrance and trim garden reminded me of my own England. I lifted up the latch of the door and entered. A kitchen first presented itself, where, guided by the moonbeams, I found materials for striking a light. Within this was a bedroom. The couch was furnished with sheets of snowy whiteness, the wood piled on the hearth, and an array as for a meal might almost have deceived me into the dear belief that I had here found what I had so long sought, one survivor, a companion for my loneliness, a solace to my despair. I steeled myself against the delusion. The room itself was vacant. It was only prudent, I repeated to myself, to examine the rest of the house. I fancied that I was proof against the expectation, yet my heart beat audibly as I laid my hand on the lock of each door, and it sunk again when I perceived in each the same vacancy. Dark and silent they were as vaults, so I returned to the first chamber, wondering what sightless host had spread the materials for my repast and my repose. I drew a chair to the table, and examined what the viands were of which I was to partake. In truth it was a death feast. The bread was blue and mouldy, the cheese lay a heap of dust. I did not dare examine the other dishes. A troop of ants passed in a double line across the tablecloth. Every utensil was covered with dust, with cobwebs, and myriads of dead flies. These were objects each and all betokening the fallaciousness of my expectations. Tears rushed into my eyes. Surely this was a wanton display of the power of the destroyer. What had I done that each sensitive nerve was thus to be anatomized? Yet why complain more now than ever? This vacant cottage revealed no new sorrow. The world was empty. Mankind was dead. I knew it well. Why quarrel, therefore, with an acknowledged and stale truth? Yet, as I said, I had hoped in the very heart of despair, so that every new impression of the hard-cut reality on my soul brought with it a fresh pang, telling me the yet unsteady lesson that neither change of place nor time could bring alleviation to my misery, but that as I now was, I must continue, day after day, month after month, year after year, while I lived. I hardly dared conjecture what space of time that expression implied. It is true I was no longer in the first blush of manhood, neither had I declined far in the veil of years. Men have accounted mine the prime of life. I had just entered my thirty-seventh year, every limb was as well knit, every articulation as true as when I had acted the shepherd on the hills of Cumberland, and with these advantages I was to commence the train of solitary life. Such were the reflections that ushered in my slumber on that night. The shelter, however, and less disturbed repose which I enjoyed, restored me the following morning to a greater portion of health and strength than I had experienced since my fatal shipwreck. Among the stores I had discovered on searching the cottage the preceding night was a quantity of dried grapes. These refreshed me in the morning, as I left my lodging and proceeded towards a town which I discerned at no great distance. As far as I could divine it must have been Forley. I entered with pleasure its wide and grassy streets. All, it is true, pictured the excess of desolation, yet I loved to find myself in those spots which had been the abode of my fellow creatures. I delighted to traverse street after street, to look up at the tall houses, and repeat to myself, once they contained beings similar to myself, I was not always the wretch I am now. The wide square of Forley, the arcade around it, its light and pleasant aspect cheered me. I was pleased with the idea that if the earth should be again peopled, we, the lost race, would, in the relics left behind, present no contemptible exhibition of our powers to the newcomers. I entered one of the palaces and opened the door of a magnificent saloon. I started, I looked again with renewed wonder. What wild-looking, unkempt, half-naked savage was that before me? The surprise was momentary. I perceived that it was I myself whom I beheld in a large mirror at the end of the hall. 
No wonder that the lover of the princely Idris should fail to recognize himself in the miserable object there pourtrayed. My tattered dress was that in which I had crawled half alive from the tempestuous sea. My long and tangled hair hung in elf locks on my brow. My dark eyes, now hollow and wild, gleamed from under them. My cheeks were discoloured by the jaundice which, the effect of misery and neglect, suffused my skin, and were half hid by a beard of many days' growth. Yet why should I not remain thus, I thought? The world is dead, and this squalid attire is a fitter morning garb than the foppery of a black suit. And thus, methinks, I should have remained, had not hope, without which I do not believe man could exist, whispered to me that, in such a plight, I should be an object of fear and aversion to the being, preserved I knew not where, but I fondly trusted at length to be found by me. Will my readers scorn the vanity that made me attire myself with some care, for the sake of this visionary being, or will they forgive the freaks of a half-crazed imagination? I can easily forgive myself, for hope, however vague, was so dear to me, and a sentiment of pleasure of so rare occurrence, that I yielded readily to any idea that cherished the one, or promised any recurrence of the former to my sorrowing heart. After such occupation I visited every street, alley, and nook of Forley. These Italian towns presented an appearance of still greater desolation than those of England or France. Plague had appeared here earlier, it had finished its course and achieved its work much sooner than with us. Probably the last summer had found no human being alive, in all the track included between the shores of Calabria and the northern Alps. My search was utterly vain, yet I did not despond. Reason, methought, was on my side, and the chances were by no means contemptible that there should exist in some part of Italy a survivor like myself, of a wasted, depopulate land. As therefore I rambled through the empty town, I formed my plan for future operations. I would continue to journey on towards Rome, after I should have satisfied myself by a narrow search that I left behind no human being in the towns through which I passed, I would write up in a conspicuous part of each with white paint in three languages that Verney, the last of the race of Englishmen, had taken up his abode in Rome. In pursuance of this scheme I entered a painter's shop and procured myself the paint. It is strange that so trivial an occupation should have consoled and even enlivened me, but grief renders one childish, despair fantastic. To this simple inscription I merely added the adjuration, Friend, come, I wait for thee. De, vieni, ti aspetto. On the following morning, with something like hope for my companion, I quitted Forley on my way to Rome. Until now, agonizing retrospect and dreary prospects for the future had stung me when awake and cradled me to my repose. Many times I had delivered myself up to the tyranny of anguish, many times I resolved a speedy end to my woes, and death by my own hands was a remedy whose practicability was even cheering to me. What could I fear in the other world? If there were a hell, and I were doomed to it, I should come an adept to the sufferance of its tortures, the act were easy, the speedy and certain end of my deplorable tragedy. But now these thoughts faded before the newborn expectation. I went on my way, not as before, feeling each hour, each minute, to be an age instinct with incalculable pain. As I wandered along the plain at the foot of the Apennines, through their valleys and over their bleak summits, my path led me through a country which had been trodden by heroes, visited and admired by thousands. They had as a tide receded, leaving me blank and bare in the midst. But why complain? Did I not hope? So I schooled myself, even after the enlivening spirit had really deserted me, and thus I was obliged to call up all the fortitude I could command, and that was not much, to prevent a recurrence of that chaotic and intolerable despair that had succeeded to the miserable shipwreck, that had consummated every fear and dashed to annihilation every joy. I rose each day with the morning sun and left my desolate inn. As my feet strayed through the unpeopled country, my thoughts rambled through the universe, and I was least miserable when I could, absorbed in reverie, forget the passage of the hours. Each evening, in spite of weariness, I detested to enter any dwelling, there to take up my nightly abode. I have sat hour after hour at the door of the cottage I had selected, unable to lift the latch and meet face to face blank desertion within. Many nights, though autumnal mists were spread around, I passed under an ilex. Many times I have supped on arbutus berries and chestnuts, making a fire gypsy-like on the ground, because wild natural scenery reminded me less acutely of my hopeless state of loneliness. I counted the days and bore with me a peeled willow wand, on which, as well as I could remember, I had notched the days that had elapsed since my wreck, and each night I added another unit to the melancholy sum. I had toiled up a hill which led to Spoleto. Around was spread a plain, encircled by the chestnut-covered Apennines. A dark ravine was on one side, spanned by an aqueduct whose tall arches were rooted in the dell below, and attested that man had once deigned to bestow labour and thought here, to adorn and civilise nature. Savage and grateful nature, which in wild sport defaced his remains, protruding her easily renewed and fragile growth of wild flowers and parasite plants around his eternal edifices. I sat on a fragment of rock and looked round. The sun had bathed in gold the western atmosphere, and in the east the clouds caught the radiance and budded into transient loveliness. 
It set on a world that contained me alone for its inhabitant. I took out my wand, I counted the marks. Twenty five were already traced, twenty five days had already elapsed since human voice had gladdened my ears, or human countenance met my gaze. Twenty five long, weary days, succeeded by dark and lonesome nights, had mingled with foregone years, and had become a part of the past, the never to be recalled, a real, undeniable portion of my life. Twenty five long, long days. Why this was not a month? Why talk of days, or weeks, or months? I must grasp years in my imagination, if I would truly picture the future to myself. Three, five, ten, twenty, fifty anniversaries of that fatal epoch might elapse. Every year containing twelve months, each of more numerous calculation in a diary than the twenty-five days gone by. Can it be? Will it be? We had been used to look forward to death tremulously, wherefore, but because its place was obscure? But more terrible, and far more obscure, was the unveiled course of my lone futurity. I broke my wand, I threw it from me, I needed no recorder of the inch and barley corn growth of my life. While my unquiet thoughts created other divisions, and those ruled over by the planets, and in looking back on the age that had elapsed since I had been alone, I disdained to give the name of days and hours to the throes of agony which had in truth portioned it out. I hid my face in my hands, the twitter of the young birds going to rest, and their rustling among the trees disturbed the still evening air. The crickets chirped, the aziolo cooed at intervals. My thoughts had been of death, these sounds spoke to me of life. I lifted up my eyes, a bat wheeled round, the sun had sunk behind the jagged line of mountains, and the paley crescent moon was visible, silver-white amidst the orange sunset, and accompanied by one bright star, prolonged thus the twilight. A herd of cattle passed along in the dell below, untended, towards their watering place. The grass was rustled by a gentle breeze, and the olive woods, mellowed into soft masses by the moonlight, contrasted their sea-green with the dark chestnut foliage. Yes, this is the earth. There is no change, no ruin, no rent made in her verdurous expanse. She continues to wheel round and round, with alternate night and day, through the sky, though man is not her adorner or inhabitant. Why could I not forget myself like one of those animals, and no longer suffer the wild tumult of misery that I endure? Yet, ah, what a deadly breach yawns between their state and mine! Have not they companions? Have not they each their mate, their cherished young, their home, which, though unexpressed to us, is, I doubt not, endeared and enriched, even in their eyes, by the society which kind nature has created for them? It is I only that am alone, I on this little hilltop, gazing on plain and mountain recess, on sky and its starry population, listening to every sound of earth and air and murmuring wave, I only cannot express to any companion my many thoughts, nor lay my throbbing head on any loved bosom, nor drink from meeting eyes an intoxicating dew that transcends the fabulous nectar of the gods. Shall I not then complain? Shall I not curse the murderous engine which has mowed down the children of men, my brethren? Shall I not bestow a malediction on every other of nature's offspring, which dares live and enjoy while I live and suffer? Ah, no, I will discipline my sorrowing heart to sympathy in your joys. I will be happy because ye are so. Live on, ye innocents, nature's selected darlings. I am not much unlike to you. Nerves, pulse, brain, joint and flesh, of such am I composed, and ye are organized by the same laws. I have something beyond this, but I will call it a defect, not an endowment, if it leads me to misery while ye are happy. Just then there emerged from a near copse two goats and a little kid by the mother's side. They began to browse the herbage of the hill. I approached near to them, without their perceiving me. I gathered a handful of fresh grass and held it out. The little one nestled close to its mother while she timidly withdrew. The male stepped forward, fixing his eyes on me. I drew near, still holding out my lure, while he, depressing his head, rushed at me with his horns. I was a very fool. I knew it, yet I yielded to my rage. I snatched up a huge fragment of rock. It would have crushed my rash foe. I poised it, aimed it, then my heart failed me. I hurled it wide of the mark. It rolled clattering among the bushes into Dell. My little visitants, all aghast, galloped back into the covert of the woods, while I, my very heart bleeding and torn, rushed down the hill, and by the violence of bodily exertion, sought to escape from my miserable self. No, no, I will not live among the wild scenes of nature, the enemy of all that lives. I will seek the towns, Rome, the capital of the world, the crown of man's achievements. Among its storied streets, hallowed ruins, and stupendous remains of human exertion, I shall not, as here, find everything forgetful of man, trampling on his memory, defacing his works, proclaiming from hill to hill and vale to vale, by the torrents freed from the boundaries which he imposed, by the vegetation liberated from the laws which he enforced, by his habitation abandoned to mildew and weeds, that his power is lost, his race annihilated for ever. I hailed the Tiber, for that was, as it were, an unalienable possession of humanity. I hailed the wild Campania, for every rood had been trod by man, and its savage uncultivation, of no recent date, only proclaimed more distinctly his power, since he had given an honourable name and sacred title to what else would have been a worthless barren track. I entered eternal Rome by the Porta del Popolo, and saluted with awe its time-honoured space. 
the wide square, the churches near, the long extent of the Corso, the near eminence of Trinita de Monti, appeared like fairy work. They were so silent, so peaceful, and so very fair. It was evening, and the population of animals which still existed in this mighty city had gone to rest. There was no sound save the murmur of its many fountains, whose soft monotony was harmony to my soul. The knowledge that I was in Rome soothed me, that wondrous city hardly more illustrious for its heroes and sages than for the power it exercised over the imaginations of men. I went to rest that night, the eternal burning of my heart quenched, my senses tranquil. The next morning I eagerly began my rambles in search of oblivion. I ascended the many terraces of the garden of the Colonna place, under whose roof I had been sleeping, and passing out from it at its summit I found myself on Monte Cavallo. The fountain sparkled in the sun, the obelisk above pierced the clear dark blue air. The statues in each side, the works as they are inscribed, of Phidias and Praxiteles, stood in undiminished grandeur, representing Castor and Pollux, who with majestic power tamed the rearing animal at their side. If those illustrious artists had in truth chiselled these forms, how many passing generations had their giant proportions outlived? And now they were viewed by the last of the species they were sculptured to represent and deify. I had shrunk into insignificance in my own eyes, as I considered the multitudinous beings these stone demigods had outlived. But this afterthought restored me to dignity in my own conception. The sight of the poetry eternized in those statues took the sting from the thought, arraying it only in poetic ideality. I repeated to myself, I am in Rome. I behold and, as it were, familiarly converse with the wonder of the world, sovereign mistress of the imagination, majestic and eternal survivor of millions of generations of extinct men. I endeavoured to quiet the sorrows of my aching heart by even now taking an interest in what in my youth I had hardently longed to see. Every part of Rome is replete with relics of ancient times. The meanest streets are strewed with truncated columns, broken capitals, Corinthian and Ionic, and sparkling fragments of granite or porphyry. The walls of the most penurious dwellings enclose a fluted pillar or ponderous stone which once made part of the palace of the Caesars, and the voice of dead time in still vibrations is breathed from these dumb things, animated and glorified as they were by man. I embraced the vast columns of the temple of Jupiter Stator, which survives in the open space that was the forum, and leaning my burning cheek against its cold durability, I tried to lose the sense of present misery and present desertion, by recalling to the haunted cell of my brain vivid memories of times gone by. I rejoiced at my success as I figured Camillus, the Gracchi, Cato, and last the heroes of Tacitus, which shine meteors of surpassing brightness during the murky night of the empire, as the verses of Horace and Virgil, or the glowing periods of Cicero, thronged into the open gates of my mind, I felt myself exalted by long-forgotten enthusiasm. I was delighted to know that I beheld the scene which they beheld, the scene which their wives and mothers and crowds of the unnamed witnessed, while at the same time they honoured, applauded, or wept for these matchless specimens of humanity. At length, then, I had found a consolation. I had not vainly sought the storied precincts of Rome, I had discovered a medicine for my many and vital wounds. I sat at the foot of these vast columns. The Colosseum, whose naked ruin is robed by nature in a verdurous and glowing veil, lay in the sunlight on my right. Not far off to the left was the tower of the capital. Triumphal arches, the falling walls of many temples, strewed the ground at my feet. I strove, I resolved, to force myself to see the plebeian multitude and lofty patrician forms congregated around, and as the diorama of ages passed across my subdued fancy, they were replaced by the modern Roman, the Pope, in his white stole, distributing benedictions to the kneeling worshippers, the friar in his cowl, the dark-eyed girl, veiled by her mezzera, the noisy sunburnt rustic leading his herd of buffaloes and oxen to the Campo Vicino. The romance with which, dipping our pencils in the rainbow hues of sky and transcendent nature, we to a degree gratuitously endow the Italians, replaced the solemn grandeur of antiquity. I remembered the dark monk and floating figures of the Italian, and how my boyish blood had thrilled at the description. I called to mind Carina ascending the capital to be crowned, and passing from the heroine to the author, reflected how the enchantress spirit of Rome held sovereign sway over the minds of the imaginative, until it rested on me, sole remaining spectator of its wonders. I was long wrapped by such ideas, but the soul wearies of a pauseless flight, and stooping from its wheeling circuits round and round this spot, suddenly it fell ten thousand fathom deep into the abyss of the present, into self-knowledge, into tenfold sadness. I roused myself, I cast off my waking dreams, and I, who just now could almost hear the shouts of the Roman throng, and was hustled by countless multitudes, now beheld the desert ruins of Rome sleeping under its own blue sky, the shadows lay tranquilly on the ground, sheep were grazing untended on the Palatine, and a buffalo stalked down the sacred way that led to the capital. I was alone in the Forum, alone in Rome, alone in the world. Would not one living man, one companion in my weary solitude, be worth all the glory and remembered power of this time-honoured city? 
Double sorrow, sadness bred in Cimmerian caves, robed my soul in a mourning garb. The generations I had conjured up to my fancy, contrasted more strongly with the end of all, the single point in which, as a pyramid, the mighty fabric of society had ended, while I, on the giddy height, saw vacant space around me. From such vague laments I turned to the contemplation of the minute of my situation. So far I had not succeeded in the sole object of my desires, the finding a companion for my desolation. Yet I did not despair. It is true that my inscriptions were set up for the most part in insignificant towns and villages, yet even without these memorials it was possible that the person, who like me should find himself alone in a depopulate land, should, like me, come to Rome. The more slender my expectation was, the more I chose to build on it, and to accommodate my actions to this vague possibility. It became necessary, therefore, that for a time I should domesticate myself at Rome. It became necessary that I should look my disaster in the face, not playing the schoolboy's part of obedience without submission, enduring life, and yet rebelling against the laws by which I lived. Yet how could I resign myself? Without love, without sympathy, without communion with any, how could I meet the morning sun, and with it trace its oft-repeated journey to the evening shades? Why did I continue to live? Why not throw off the weary weight of time, and with my own hand, let out the fluttering prisoner from my agonized breast? It was not cowardice that withheld me, for the true fortitude was to endure, and death had a soothing sound accompanying it, that would easily entice me to enter its demesne. But this I would not do. I had, from the moment I had reasoned on the subject, instituted myself the subject of fate, and the servant of necessity, the visible laws of the invisible God. I believed that my obedience was the result of sound reasoning, pure feeling, and an exalted sense of the true excellence and nobility of my nature. Could I have seen in this empty earth, in the seasons and their change, the hand of a blind power only, most willingly would I have placed my head on the sod, and closed my eyes on its loveliness for ever. But fate had administered life to me. When the plague had already seized on its prey, she had dragged me by the hair from out the strangling waves. By such miracles she had brought me for her own. I admitted her authority and bowed to her decrees. If, after mature consideration, such was my resolve, it was doubly necessary that I should not lose the end of life, the improvement of my faculties, and poison its flow by repinings without end. Yet how cease to repine, since there was no hand near to extract the barbed spear that had entered my heart of hearts? I stretched out my hand, and it touched none whose sensations were responsive to mine. I was girded, walled in, vaulted over, by sevenfold barriers of loneliness. Occupation alone, if I could deliver myself up to it, would be capable of affording an opiate to my sleepless sense of woe. Having determined to make Rome my abode, at least for some months, I made arrangements for my accommodation. I selected my home. The Colonna Palace was well adapted for my purpose. Its grandeur, its treasure of paintings, its magnificent halls were objects soothing and even exhilarating. I found the granaries of Rome well stored with grain, and particularly with Indian corn. This product requiring less art in its preparation for food, I selected as my principal support. I now found the hardships and lawlessness of my youth turned to account. A man cannot throw off the habits of sixteen years. Since that age, it is true, I had lived luxuriously, or at least surrounded by all the conveniences civilization afforded, but before that time I had been as uncouth a savage as the wolf-bred founder of old Rome, and now in Rome itself, robber and shepherd propensities, similar to those of its founder, were of advantage to its sole inhabitant. I spent the morning riding and shooting in the Campagna, I passed long hours in the various galleries, I gazed at each statue, and lost myself in a reverie before many a fair Madonna or beauteous nymph. I haunted the Vatican, and stood surrounded by marble forms of divine beauty. Each stone deity was possessed by sacred gladness, and the eternal fruition of love. They looked on me with unsympathizing complacency, and often in wild accents I reproached them for their supreme indifference, for they were human shapes, the human form divine was manifest in each fairest limb and lineament. The perfect moulding brought with it the idea of colour and motion. Often, half in bitter mockery, half in self-delusion, I clasped their icy proportions, and coming between Cupid and his psyche's lips pressed the unconceiving marble. I endeavoured to read, I visited the libraries of Rome, I selected a volume, and choosing some sequestered shady nook on the banks of the Tiber, or opposite the fair temple in the Borghese gardens, or under the old pyramid of Cestius, I endeavoured to conceal me from myself, and immerse myself in the subject traced on the pages before me. As if in the same soil you plant nightshade and a myrtle tree, they will each appropriate the mould, moisture, and air administered for the fostering their several properties. So did my grief find sustenance and power of existence and growth in what else had been divine manner, to feed radiant meditation. Ah, while I streak this paper with the tale of what my so-named occupations were, while I shape the skeleton of my days, my hand trembles, my heart pants, and my brain refuses to lend expression or phrase or idea by which to image forth the veil of unutterable woe that clothed these bare realities. 
O worn and beating heart, may I dissect thy fibres and tell how in each unmitigable misery, sadness dire, repinings and despair existed! May I record my many ravings, the wild curses I hurled at torturing nature, and how I have passed days shut out from light and food, from all except the burning hell alive in my own bosom! I was presented, meantime, with one other occupation, the one best fitted to discipline my melancholy thoughts, which strayed backwards over many a ruin, and through many a flowery glade, even to the mountain recess from which in early youth I had first emerged. During one of my rambles through the habitations of Rome, I found writing materials on a table in an author's study. Parts of a manuscript lay scattered about. It contained a learned disquisition on the Italian language, one page an unfinished dedication to posterity, for whose profit the writer had sifted and selected the niceties of this harmonious language, to whose everlasting benefit he bequeathed his labours. I also will write a book, I cried, for whom to read, to whom dedicate it, and then with silly flourish, what so capricious and childish as despair, I wrote, Dedication to the illustrious dead, shadows arise and read your fall, behold the history of the last man. Yet will not this world be repeopled, and the children of a saved pair of lovers, in some to me unknown and unattainable seclusion, wandering to these prodigious relics of the anti-pestilential race, seek to learn how being so wondrous in their achievements, with imaginations infinite and powers godlike, had departed from their home to an unknown country. I will write and leave in this most ancient city this world's sole monument, a record of these things. I will leave a monument of the existence of Verney, the last man. At first I thought only to speak of plague, of death, and last of desertion, but I lingered fondly on my early years, and recorded with sacred zeal the virtues of my companions. They have been with me during the fulfilment of my task. I have brought it to an end. I lift my eyes from my paper. Again they are lost to me. Again I feel that I am alone. A year has passed since I have been thus occupied. The seasons have made their wonted round, and decked this eternal city in a changeful robe of surpassing beauty. A year has passed, and I no longer guess at my state or my prospects. Loneliness is my familiar, sorrow my inseparable companion. I have endeavoured to brave the storm, I have endeavoured to school myself to fortitude, I have sought to imbue myself with the lessons of wisdom. It will not do. My hair has become nearly grey, my voice, unused now to utter sound, comes strangely on my ears. My person, with its human powers and features, seem to me a monstrous excrescence of nature. How express in human language a woe human being until this hour never knew? How give intelligible expression to a pang none but I could ever understand? No one has entered Rome, none will ever come. I smile bitterly at the delusion I have so long nourished, and still more when I reflect that I have exchanged it for another as delusive, as false, but to which I now cling with the same fond trust. Winter has come again, and the gardens of Rome have lost their leaves, the sharp air comes over the Campagna, and has driven its brute inhabitants to take up their abode in the many dwellings of the deserted city, frost has suspended the gushing fountains, and Trevi has stilled her eternal music. I had made a rough calculation, aided by the stars, by which I endeavoured to ascertain the first day of the new year. In the old outworn age the sovereign pontiff was used to go in solemn pomp, and mark the renewal of the year by driving a nail in the gate of the temple of Janus. On that day I ascended St. Peter's, and carved on its topmost stone the era 2100, last year of the world. My only companion was a dog, a shaggy fellow, half water and half shepherd's dog, whom I found tending sheep in the Campagna. His master was dead, but nevertheless he continued fulfilling his duties in expectation of his return. If a sheep strayed from the rest, he forced it to return to the flock, and sedulously kept off every intruder. Riding in the Campania I had come upon his sheep-walk, and for some time observed his repetition of lessons learned from man, now useless though unforgotten. His delight was excessive when he saw me, he sprung up to my knees, he capered round and round, wagging his tail with the short quick bark of pleasure, he left his fold to follow me, and from that day has never neglected to watch by and attend on me, showing boisterous gratitude whenever I caressed or talked to him. His pattering steps and mine alone were heard when we entered the magnificent extent of nave and isle of St. Peter's. We ascended the myriad steps together, when on the summit I achieved my design, and in rough figures noted the date of the last year. I then turned to gaze on the country, and to take leave of Rome. I had long determined to quit it, and I now formed the plan I would adopt for my future career, after I had left this magnificent abode. A solitary being is by instinct a wanderer, and that I would become. A hope of amelioration always attends on change of place, which would even lighten the burthen of my life. I had been a fool to remain in Rome all this time. Rome noted for malaria, the famous caterer for death. But it was still possible that, could I visit the whole extent of earth, I should find in some part of the wide extent a survivor. Methought the seaside was the most probable retreat to be chosen by such a one. If left alone in an inland district, still they could not continue in the spot where their last hopes had been extinguished. They would journey on, like me, in search of a partner for their solitude, till the watery barrier stopped their further progress. 
to that water, cause of my woes, perhaps now to be their cure, I would betake myself. Farewell, Italy, farewell, thou ornament of the world, matchless Rome, the retreat of the solitary wandering long months, to civilized life, to the settled home and succession of monotonous days, farewell. Peril will now be mine, and I hail her as a friend. Death will perpetually cross my path, and I will meet him as a benefactor. Hardship, inclement weather, and dangerous tempests will be my sworn mates. Ye spirits of storm, receive me. Ye powers of destruction, open wide your arms and clasp me for ever. If a kinder power have not decreed another end, so that after long endurance I may reap my reward, and again feel my heart beat near the heart of another like to me. Tiber, the road which is spread by nature's own hand, threading her continent, was at my feet, and many a boat was tethered to the banks. I would, with a few books, provisions, and my dog, embark in one of these, and float down the current of the stream into the sea, and then, keeping near land, I would coast the beauteous shores and sunny promontories of the blue Mediterranean, past Naples, along Calabria, and would dare the twin perils of Scylla and Charybdis, then with fearless aim, for what had I to lose, skim ocean surface towards Malta and the further Cyclades. I would avoid Constantinople, the site of whose well-known towers and inlets belong to another state of existence from my present one. I would coast Asia Minor and Syria, and passing the seven-mouthed Nile, steer northward again, till losing sight of forgotten Carthage and deserted Libya, I should reach the pillars of Hercules, and then, no matter where, the oozy caves and soundless depths of ocean may be my dwelling, before I accomplish this long-drawn voyage, or the arrow of disease find my heart as I float singly on the weltering Mediterranean, or in some place I touch at I may find what I seek, a companion. Or if this may not be, to endless time, decrepit and grey-headed, youth already in the grave with those I love, the lone wanderer will still unfurl his sail and clasp the tiller, and, still obeying the breezes of heaven, for ever round another and another promontory, anchoring in another and another bay, still ploughing seedless ocean, leaving behind the verdant land of native Europe. Adown the towny shore of Africa, having weathered the fierce seas of the Cape, I may moor my worn skiff in a creek, shaded by spicy groves of the odorous islands of the far Indian Ocean." These are wild dreams, yet since now a week ago they came on me, as I stood on the height of St. Peter's, they have ruled my imagination. I have chosen my boat, and laid in my scant stores. I have selected a few books, the principal are Homer and Shakespeare, but the libraries of the world are thrown open to me, and in any port I can renew my stock. I form no expectation of alteration for the better, but the monotonous present is intolerable to me. Neither hope nor joy are my pilots, restless despair and fierce desire of change lead me on. I long to grapple with danger, to be excited by fear, to have some task, however slight or voluntary, for each day's fulfilment. I shall witness all the variety of appearance that the elements can assume. I shall read fair augury in the rainbow, menace in the cloud, some lesson or record dear to my heart in everything. Thus around the shores of deserted earth, while the sun is high and the moon waxes or wanes, angels, the spirits of the dead, and the ever open eye of the supreme, will behold the tiny bark, freighted with Verney, the last man. End of Volume 3, Chapter 10 and End of The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley Thank you once again for listening to Black Clock Audio Tales. You can find us online at Black Clock Audio Tales on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Meet up with us at pgttcm.com Find out what's going on with this and other podcasts by Badger Drift Studios, which is where we record this in beautiful North Portland. If you want to be on a show, if you have a book that you would like to have reviewed, if you want to be on Welcome to Portland, eat charcuterie and drink beer in the studio while learning how to podcast, I can accommodate that. But you have to take the first step by going to pgttcm.com and submitting, send us a link to your stories, become friends with us on Facebook at uh, PGTTCM or Black Clock Audio Tales. And PGTTCM, of course, is short for The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, our monthly show at the end of every month on Tuesday we have PGTTCM. Thank you so much for listening. Edited by D.B. Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod, as always. Thank you.